Good Friday morning, my Brentwood Christian freshman. Welcome to Bible. Let's go ahead and begin with prayer, if you'll bow with me, please. Father and God, thank you that you have blessed us again and again. Even in difficult times, Father, we know that you work for those who love you, who are called according to your purposes. Help us, Father, to listen for your call. Help us to love you deeply. And Father, even in confusing times, please lead us. Lead us into your will and enable us to experience your presence and your glory. We pray this in the name and for the sake of Jesus. Amen. All right. Open up a screen here right quick. Just a quick reminder of the themes for Acts. The first one we saw on the day of Pentecost is that, there we go, is that uh, the mission of the church is to witness to and continue the work of Jesus. Excuse me, we saw that in the very first verse, right? And the day of Pentecost, we saw that there is no barrier that the gospel cannot go across, neither racial, nor ethnic, nor language, nor cultural. Before the gospel, all of those barriers come down. This is because of the power by the, through the work of the Holy Spirit, which came down on one of the disciples at Pentecost. The one in the same way that it came down, or in a similar way to where it came down on Jesus in the Gospel of Luke, which leads God's people throughout the time, which actually came upon the church at Antioch before they sent Paul and Barnabas out. So the Holy Spirit is that power. And as we see in opposition, especially as the Jews who grew up with Torah, with Moses' law, that they knew everything about God, but to know about God is not the same thing as knowing God, as listening to and being ready to obey, to hear his voice. We saw this in Corn uh, the conversion of Cornelius. God's salvation is for everyone. He does not show favoritism. And that goes along back with the gospel going across language and cultural barriers. And finally, this one is a new one for this week that God uses circumstances to place his servants where he wants them. We've seen that a bit in the past. Now, I want us to notice this one here. Okay, first of all, uh, we talked about how the, gospel, or the church at Antioch felt the moving of the Spirit, asked Barnabas and, call, and Saul to go to take the gospel across into what today we would call Turkey, what is uh, then they called Asia Minor. So they came across here, landed on the island of Cyprus, and uh, had a couple of encounters there that are interesting. They come up here to Iconium and Lystra, finally, where they encounter a, uh, a lame man who they heal, and the people think they're gods. They say, no, no, we're not. We, remember, we, did, uh, we talked yesterday with each, pardon me, we talked Monday with each other about how we, we take compliments. How do we turn every conversation, every honor that we receive back to the glory of God? Well, that's what Paul and Barnabas did here. Of course, it got Paul being stoned, but he did arise up again when the disciples gathered around him. This is such an important meeting that we don't really have time to go into with the Jerusalem conference. Uh, the question before them was, must Gentiles become Jews? Did they have to follow the law of Moses? Particularly the one that was at issue was circumcision. But did they have to follow the whole law? Or did they keep their ethnic identity as Gentiles and worship Christ, worship God through Christ? And the answer, seemingly, at least from the leaders that Luke recounts, was unanimous. Peter tells them about the conversion of Cornelius. Paul and Barnabas tell them about what had happened in their ministry, that the, the Gentiles were coming. And even though they were still Gentiles, yes, they ate pork. Yes, they didn't uh, speak Hebrew, but still they were turning their lives to Jesus. And then finally, James, the brother of Jesus, a leader in the Jerusalem church, a true blue Jew through and through, said, look, it becomes obvious. We must allow them in. This is God's will. They do then send them some advice. Said basically, look, we have some things that you really ought not to do. All right. Uh, now I'm going to look here 
and read them right quick if I can get them turned to my paper. Sorry. All right. And they say here basically, ah, <laughs> sorry, I went the wrong way. There it is. Uh, make sure that uh, you abstain from food sacrificed to idols, from blood, and from the meat of strangled idols. Meat strangled animals. These were all associated with idol worship. And last of all, from sexual immorality. So if you'll do that, do these things that are quite obvious. Obviously, you don't need to be sexually immoral. Sexually immoral. You also don't need to worship other gods. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob calls us to exclusive worship, and especially through Jesus, the one who died for us. So they sent this letter out. Now, after this, at the end of uh, end of chapter 14, uh, pardon me, end of chapter 15, Paul and Barnabas think about going back over the same area they had gone. They decide not to because they had a big dispute. Barnabas's cousin, a fellow named John Mark, had gone with them on the first journey, and he backed out. He quit halfway through. Barnabas was really ready to give him another chance. Paul was not. So Paul and Barnabas split. Barnabas and John Mark went back here, apparently across and went the same path they had been. On the other hand, Barnabas, pardon me, Paul gets a new compatriot, a guy named Silas, and comes up this way and across to Tarsus and Derby, and then goes up here into an area called Bithynia, where the spirit wouldn't let him go. In fact, it says uh, here in uh, chapter 16, verse 7, when they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter in Bithynia, but the spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. Remember, the spirit leads you. The spirit is power. Well, if the spirit's not empowering, then what do you do? Uh, so they passed by Mysia and went down to Troas. So they went by this area. They tried to go up to Bithynia. They couldn't, so they pulled across over here to Troas. Confused, unsure. Remember we talked last week, how do you know God's will? How can you discern this? Well, Paul doesn't know. I'm sure he's praying. He knows his Hebrew scripture. He, he's there with Silas, maybe other, other, other helpers aren't around, but in the night, he has a dream, a vision of a man from Macedonia, right over here, Macedonia coming up and saying, come help us. So they leave Troas, they come across here to land at Neapolis and up to Philippi. Philippi, a Roman garrison, very, very, very heavily uh, populated with Roman soldiers. And in fact, many of them with retired Roman soldiers. So he moves in, there apparently is not a synagogue Apparently, there are not enough Jewish men, you had to have 10 minimum, to have a synagogue. So they began looking around on the Sabbath for a group of Hebrews, some Jews, someplace perhaps to pray with, to talk Torah with. They found by the riverside a group of women they found gathered there. And one of them was a woman from Lydia, a seller of purple, which means that she had sold some pretty expensive fabrics. She becomes a believer and she invites them to come stay with her. They continue to be, be preaching. They continue to do what Paul does, right? Uh, he speech, speaks in the marketplace and he gets someone, a woman, by the way, this is in a sense a story of women who are very, very important in the women's movement and the women in the early Christian movement. Uh, Lydia becoming the first convert in Europe. This slave girl who has an evil spirit, she's a prophet of some sort, but not of God, but she apparently is hearing these voices. She shout, shouts out to people, uh, these men are servants of the Most High God, telling you the way to be saved. And, and apparently, it, I'm guessing it created laughter. It may run people off. And Paul finally gets so annoyed and he turns around and says, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you come out of her. And the spirit did. And all of a sudden she's free. She's free from this demon, but she also cannot prophesy anymore. So her slave owners go, wait, you just stole our means of making money. 
they throw Paul and Silas into prison after beating them overnight. They are praying. And as they pray, excuse me, bring that up, as they're praying and singing, an earthquake comes, knocks down the walls. The jailer comes in knowing that his life is forfeit. A, a Roman soldier who lets your prisoners escape owes his own life. He comes in, I can imagine him pulling out his long sword, leaning it in the corner against a wall and putting it right under his breastbone, right there, right where the ribs meet, right under the sternum. And all of a sudden, Paul and Silas, perhaps coming out singing, says, hey, no, don't, don't kill yourself. Don't harm yourself. We're all here. And the jailer, having heard, I'm sure having heard them singing and praying at night, falls before them and says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? They tell him the good news of Jesus. They go in. Uh, it's, it's interesting. The jailer takes them and washes their wounds, right? Washes them off, cleans them up because they had been beaten pretty badly. And then they wash the jailer. They and his household, perhaps his wife, maybe any adult children, are baptized. They have a meal together. Shades of the Lord's Supper. I don't know if it was the Lord's Supper, but they share a meal. Gentile and Jew together. What a change in the first part of this book. Then finally the next morning, the magistrates, the city council, send a message. Hey, you can let these guys go. We're, we're through with them. Get them out. Just get them out of town. And... Uh, the jailer tells Paul, hey, good news. The city council has said you can go. You may leave. Verse 37 of chapter 16. Paul says, they beat us publicly and without a trial, even though we're Roman citizens, and threw us into prison. And now they want to get rid of us quietly? No. Let them come down themselves and escort us out. A bit of humor here. The magistrates all of a sudden find... We have beaten a Roman citizen without hearing charges. We, we didn't try. Whoa, whoa, they are in such trouble. In fact, if Paul, especially there in a garrison, could find a judge, a Roman judge who might listen to him and be sympathetic, he could bring the whole crew into deep, deep, deep trouble. So the whole city council comes out to Paul and basically says, oh, you know, please, we'll... We're so sorry. Come on out. We'll, you know, we'll release you. We'll walk you out of town. So Paul and Silas, you're surrounded by the city council, start to walk out of town. And one little last thing, last thing to me, verse 40. After they came out of prison, did they leave town? No, they went to Lydia's house and talked with their recent converts, the folks who just joined Christ. And I can imagine the city council going, is he going to go see a judge? What's he going to do? No, last verse in chapter 16, then they left. Be sure today, please get in your uh, prayer journal. Make sure you write at least three sentences on each one of them that should have been going on every day. Finish it, click submit. By 10 p.m., new time, not midnight, by 10 p.m., get it done. And I'll check it and get it back to you. Next week, we'll hit one of my favorite chapters, the chapter on the church in Thessalonica and finishing up on Paul's famous sermon on Mars Hill. Looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to seeing you Friday morning at 1030. Show up and uh, we'll talk through what was mentioned on Chapel Wednesday. All right. Have a blessed day.